Hello and welcome back to A Drunk History of Middle Earth. This is a show where we take the Legendarium created by J.R. Tolkien and have a good, simple, wholesome chat about it. Sometimes it's a drunk person, me, trying to explain stories or events, and sometimes it's breaking down the stories and concepts as if we're talking to a drunk person. I'm Chris, I'm an avid talking nerd, I'm still learning and realising how much I actually don't know. And joining me is your co-host and my lovely wife Rebecca. Do you want to say hello? Hello, I'm Rebecca, uh, a complete novice to all things Tolkien and um, nerdy in general. Although now I've watched all three films, extended editions, and can now confirm that I have been converted to the religion headed by L. Ron Tubbard. Long may he live. <laughs> right. <laughs> Zoltan. Zoltan. <laughs> that's the intro sorted. Let's get into today's episode. Hello. Good evening. Happy Sunday. It's uh, it's not Friday. It's it's Sunday where, well, we didn't record on Friday this week, did we, Becca? No, we didn't. We were a bit chilly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we didn't record on Saturday either, did we? No, we were a bit chilly. Yes, we were. Yes, we were. We had to move out of our house um, for a night and then came back because it was fucking unbearable where we went um, because the gas supply went off across like 300, 400 homes in our area. So that was nice. But we're back. We've got an electric heater for our daughter. So she's warm and we've got hoodies and blankets and hot water bottles and both our phones are on silent. So there's going to be no annoying uh, that was totally you because no one ever texts me. Right, your so phone is on. Just... Your phone is on vibrate now, and you it's have got near... two notifications from people who've just texted you. No, so I'm going to put your phone not on just silence. People who've just texted me. There was only one person who was messaging me. Whatever, Minga. Your phone always goes off. So it doesn't, right? So on what? Well, what uh, Discord does because I talk to people on Discord, but. Um, my WhatsApp, so I don't know if you've seen my WhatsApp recently, I, I don't know when you would have, but it's only you in the um, the main screen, so you're the only person I get notifications for, because you're the only person who I'd want to respond and want to know immediately if they've messaged Aww, me. Nice. Everyone else is archived, so that I can, like, it won't distract me, and then I can go and so, do it. So, out of all the characters in Lord of the Rings, which character would you choose to have notifications on? For You can only have one. Right, I feel like I'd, uh, in the previous episodes I've led myself into the trap where everyone would think Sam. However, Sam would probably be like, oh, you seen these apples I just picked? Here, have 12 pictures. But uh, in all reality, it'd probably be Gandalf because if he texts you, it's for something important. Like, mm. he's like, you're all right. Don't go to Gondor tomorrow. And I'd be like, oh, shit, okay, I'm not going there. You know, like, so Gandalf is the one I'd, I'd want to get notifications from. Um, he seems like a very chill RSS feed. Like he's not just gonna, <clears throat> he's not gonna shit it up with like pointless updates and that. What about you? Mine would be Aragorn. I. Yeah. Why? Because um, it just seems like he would send good gifts, and um, and he's quite serious as well. So mm. I feel like he was would have that sort of serious humour. That I have very bland. It, you don't have serious humour because well, what's my... you laugh at fart jokes, so that's not serious no, humour. No, I laugh when I plump. You laugh when our kid falls over. So do I. It's hilarious, but like that's not serious humour. That's so that she jumps back up. Oh yeah, but uh, how, do you feel like you've learned a lot over the last six weeks? Because this is kind of like I've said before. This is like if we were Marvel, this would be. Um, this would be the Avenger, the first Avengers film. Now, this would be the culmination of the beginning of the first phase of things. Um, I feel like I've learned lots of stuff that it is very interesting, but hard for me to not mix it in with reality. <laughs> so, like when we watched part two of the towers, and with the Ents, and then everywhere I went, I felt like the trees were alive. Everywhere you went, you thought the trees and were alive. Because I feel like my whole life has now become Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah, because okay. Because you listen to it, you read it next to me. When we're in the car, you're listening to stuff. 
No, I wasn't listening to stuff. You're no. always giving me lowdowns. Yeah, when, things, when so. we were in the, you're confusing that. So we went to uh, Raby Castle yesterday with our little girl, and on the way there, I was telling Becca the creation story of Arda and and the legendarium, and I started. I was like, it's just started really innocently enough. Of like, oh yeah, did you know that like um, Middle Earth uh, and that began with music, and then from that I was, we we I think we got as far as. And then the elves walk under starlight, and that's where, and that's why they always love stars so much. And you were like, I just can't take any more of this. Like, it's so confusing. Yeah, but <laughs> that hasn't been the only occasion. No, it hasn't. It's been like that for six weeks. Well, what about last week when I got uh, I got two or and Turin mixed up? And yeah, there was too much Turin and Toror and Turororor. Yeah, too, well, one of them's called fucking Turin Turimba. So, so yeah, too much. It's all that about. But I no Return of the King overall. What we thought, uh, Return of the King Part 2, right? So uh, we ended at Grond, and we picked up, well, we picked up with the Corsairs. But before we get into that, how do you, what, what were your thoughts on that part of the film? So, I like Grond. Grond, 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 which I would not stop doing when we were watching it. Yeah, and at Raby Castle. Oh, yeah, because they have the big wooden doors. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Grond would have fucked those doors up. Yeah, that was... I enjoyed that part. Obviously, it was um, like once all the orcs and stuff started jumping through the hole, mm. then it looked pretty hopeless. Oh yeah. So that well, um, it's it's interesting. It seems like week week on week we come back to the themes of hope and hopelessness. It seems like it's it's one of the main themes we've discussed throughout. Like all, well, this will be the sixth episode, isn't it? Right, all six episodes. At some point, I think we've discussed hope and hopelessness. It's uh, quite interesting how that's woven into the films, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's woven into the works, the story, regardless of of medium. But uh, yeah, so in terms of this as a Return of the King, as then as a film, how did you think it held up? It wasn't my favorite, just because it of it has Frodo in more, and I'm not keen on Frodo. Right. I mean, it's the main character. I just don't. They've all got Frodo in. He is the ring yeah, bearer. Yeah, but he's in. He's in this one more, and um, yeah, I just I don't enjoy him as much. Um, and sort of the the journey as well that they take. It doesn't appeal to me. Mm. Watching them clambering up and down things, and it's, I like yeah. the moments. Like I, I like the moments where you see Sam. But uh, Gollum, I don't particularly. I'm not that bothered about Gollum. I'm not that bothered about Frodo. So I predominantly like the parts where there's battles. I do like all the action scenes. Uh, I do think you might have just offended, literally the the under ten digits of people who listen to this. And the one guy, there's one person who is a man in Denmark who's listened to this that I can see from the breakdown. So maybe he was a massive Hobbit fan. We'd gained a fan in Denmark and you've just fucked it for us. Sorry, Denmark guy, whoever you are. But shall we uh, Shall we discuss the film? Uh, well, the, the sec, well, let's discuss disc two of the extended edition of Return of the King. So we ended with Grond, Grond, Grond. But... We pick up Peter Jackson, Blue Ball, and us again. We don't get straight into the Siege of Minas Tirith. Um, instead, we pick up with uh, the Corsairs of Umbar going up the river in their black ships. And then you see Aragorn telling them they may go no further. Yeah, and then so, like laughing. Yeah, like they, they laughed. Everyone laughed until Aragorn tells Legolas to, to fire a warning shot past the bosun's shoulder or, or something like that. And Gimli, the little shit, knocks his, uh, knocks his bow and he ends up shooting the Corsair, who is Peter Jackson. That's Peter Jackson's cameo again. So in the no, in the in Fellowship of the Ring, he is uh, just a random man munching a carrot in Bree. I think he's got a cameo in The Hobbit somewhere as well. He basically pops up a couple of times, um, mm-hmm. Peter Jackson does, but pff, he's the fucking director who's going to say no. Yeah. But yeah, the uh, the the the, the Corsairs laugh at like what are you three gonna do, and then a great scene is um, all the ghosts burst out of the mountain. Yeah. So such good payoff. Like, what what did you think of the ghosts? As, uh... You had a question about the ghosts actually, didn't you? Like, were you a bit you were a bit confused as to whether they were just men? I think. Yeah, is that right? I, I just questioned 
whether it was just men or there was a mix of species. Yeah. So, as we've discussed previously, men are they they leave the circles of the world when they die, and these men couldn't leave the circles of the. I think do you know actually I think dwarves they made a vow. Yes. So they made an oath, which, as you know, um, I'm glad you remember that. Yeah, oaths have power. And this was an oath sworn by the king of the uh, the king of the mountain, or the king of the men of the mountain, to a sealed or that had come and help at the time that he fights Sauron, but it didn't come. So sealed or cursed them until their oath was fulfilled. Yeah. So it was just it was literally a kingdom's army who uh, who didn't come and fight Sauron. But yeah, it is just it is just men, um, perhaps some women, but like it's it's of, of the Edai, I think. And um, the Corsairs of Umbar as well, which. Um, they're, they're pirates, basically, who go up and down the coast of Middle-earth. Um, that's who they are. That's what the black ships are. And they were going to join Sauron, which we discussed last time. That yeah. If they had made it, it'd been uh, bad shit. But then we uh, we switched to uh, your favourite character, who's Frodo, who uh, they they get to the, the caves in the pass of Kirithungal, and Smeagol enacts his plan as uh, he leads Frodo into the cave, where Frodo, oh, well, too late, he starts to realise, oh, I've been a bit of a dick to Sam here. And Samwise, meanwhile, is poor, poor, poor Sean Astin having to go down these fucking stairs. Peter Jackson's just got this weird thing about ridiculous stairs, and I don't know what it is. But he's going back down the worst stairs in the world, and when he slips, he finds the discarded Lembath bread, which I was reading today as well, funnily enough. Um, someone had commented, like, posted... Um, I think it was on Reddit. Someone had posted that Lembas bread is the reason pretty much that the hobbits are able to go on. So the more that they rely on Lembas bread unmixed with anything else, it, it, it's, it has like a kind of magic in it. So um, it has the magic that it gives them vita- vitality to be able to, to, to carry on, basically to, to be able to carry on when all hope is gone. And, it's mentioned in the books that um, only elf queens can make lembas bread, I think, or it's reserved for elf royalty. So that's just a bit of an extra depth to it there, that um, the importance of lembas, I didn't realise until this week, is much more significant than I thought, that it is actually got like a kind of, it's not just good food, it's kind of got like a magic in it as well, like it will, it gives you hope when there is none almost. Yeah. Which is pretty good. So we all need a bit of lembas bread. We all need a bit of lembas bread in those dark days. Now, this is the only time that I'll admonish Samwise Gamgee on this podcast. Uh, are you ready for it? He shouldn't have crumbled that bread in his hands when he got angry. He rationed it yeah, because that food was running out. And, and, he's just... and then he's just like, I know it's a very good way of showing like, oh, I'm so angry. And he crumbles it between his fingers. No, Sam, those are fucking rations. It's called rations for a reason. It's because there's, there's a finite amount of it that you need. And it's li- like when you're skinned. And you accidentally drop your drink, you have to get the straw and suck it off. Uh, yeah, and later on, when the, do you know when they're on the slopes of Mount Doom? Like, and Frodo, and, and Sam's trying to remind him of stuff, and he says, like, do you remember the taste of strawberries? And Frodo yeah. says, I can't remember the taste of food. Well, you fucking would if Sam hadn't crumbled all that bread because he was angry. But I'll let him, let, like, I'll, I've said my piece. I'll say no more. We go back to Frodo, um, and he remembers the gift of Galadriel, which is, uh, do you know, the, the, the light of Erendil. Yeah. And uh, what, well, so what What did you think when you met Shelob for the first time? When you see her behind Frodo, and she uncurls her big ass legs? She's just a giant spider. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, worried. No? Huh? <laughs> just chop her legs off and she'd be stuck. Now, this has been bugging me. Ah! Ha ha. Uh, pun not intended. It has been bugging me because when Sam fights Shelob, I swear down, I remember reading somewhere that Sam is the first person who have ever have been able to properly wound Shelob. And it's only because in the like in the books, like he doesn't stab her. She drops her weight down on him on a sting. Mm. And I just I can't for the life of me remember where I fucking read it. Um but whatever. Um Because Frodo does chop a leg off. Or chop some I'm sure it- no, Shoot. Frodo gets he gets bitched by her. He just gets absolutely slapped oh, about. Like, I thought he does take a swipe and does get something off. Not really. She rears back a lot. I think as well, 
seeing other spiders, giant spiders represented in films. I'm not going to mention one because I don't want to talk about this in the Lord of the Rings podcast. But again, yeah. big, big spiders are usually much bigger than that, and she didn't look that big. Yeah, if you'd have met her mum, Ungoliant probably would have had a, a different. Frodo remembers a glyph of Galadriel, and he holds up the Star of Erendil and says, Aya Arendel Elenion and Kalima, which is Ken Quenya or Kenya, for Hail Arendil, brightest of stars. What's interesting is Frodo doesn't know what that means or why he says it. So in the books it's almost like it comes unbidden to his lips. So I'm split on whether that is Galadriel's influence or whether that's Eru Iluvatar's influence of just so like it, God in this world, like he just gives little pushes and nudges every now and then, which we'll see right at the end. Um, but he's not a directly intervening God. He's kind of like, you'll set all the domino pieces up millions of years in advance. And you know when we were going to, to, the, to the castle yesterday and you were stuck in the car with me and you couldn't do anything except drive into the central reservation when I started talking about this again? Yeah. But um, like I was talking that like when Melkor tried to sing his creations into the the into the Iron Dale, Iron Dale or Iron Dali, the music of creation. Yeah. And Melkor held up his hand and stopped the music uh, with a, a clear note and said, "Whatever you do is only allowed because I allow it. So whatever you try and design only exists because I let it. You can't design anything. You can't create anything yourself. So I think that that's that that lead that leads me to think that it might be God's kind of like little push that at that time Frodo suddenly." has the inspiration to say the one thing he needs, not to save him now, but to ultimately ensure that he survives long enough. But, you know, but as I mentioned, she, uh, Shelob or Shelob is a descendant of Ungoliant and she probably fled to Kirithungol sometime before or during the sinking of Beleriand, which is the continent that used to exist in the northwest of Middle-earth. And Shelob and her mom and all, all her brothers and sisters lived in um, the mountains called Ered Gorgoroth, which are the Mountains of Terror, but they lived in a particular valley called Nangundungotheb, which was the basically a valley full of creatures like Shelob, which scary. Very scary. <laughs> Not if you are one of the creatures, though. No, no, it would be as well, because Ungoliant ate, ate her children. Ate okay. her children, yeah. So Ungolian made it with other giant spiders. When she, so when uh, when Ungolian and Melkor fled Aman after they um, stole the Silmarils and destroyed the two trees, they eventually came over to like uh, to like Beleriand, and she uh, and Ungolian mated with other giant spiders she found in the valleys there, and she ate her partners and ate her offspring because the the driving force with Ungolian is that it's her hunger. And that's what ultimately destroys her. She eats herself. It's it's just this all consuming hunger, and that's Ungoliant. If she so Shelob and any other wise kids um just got the fuck out of there. Or, or like hid from her so that she wouldn't eat them. But she uh, I think the giant spiders of Mirkwood are actually Shelob's descendants. Or if not, they are descendants from Ungoliant as well, but they're much lesser descendants. So that's why I think they're Shelob's kids. Mm. But yeah, that's um. Uh, but yeah, Frodo's stuck in the web, as we saw him just getting twanged around, and all I could think of is um, I've showed you that meme of that guy who goes to the gym and he's drinking like a big jug of milk and he's just oh, making yeah. a massive scene and he's got all the resistance bands in the squat rack. <laughs> he's like screaming as he's like twanging himself around, and that's all I could think of. Um, so I I don't want to be patronized on this, but why? Have, have I explained to you at all, or did it, did you wonder why Gollum just seems to be able to wander around there? I just thought that he was familiar with the place anyway. Mm. Um, and as well, he's still um, under the power of the ring, which like leads people to do bad things, so I would expect that the ring was influencing him as well and giving him answers. No, fair enough. Yeah, it might have something to do with the ring, but... Um... Uh, but it's mainly basically Gollum is too scrawny to eat. That's it. Like Shelob once captured Gollum, I think, and, and basically he told her, I'm too scrawny to eat, but I can bring you victims. 
and so she let him go basically like a mutualistic relationship yeah pretty much um so she she lob is is kind of unique in that she lives she's un like she's allowed to go unbothered in the caves of earth gong uh kirith Ungol because that it heads straight into mordor it's one of the paths paths into mordor but sauron knows she's there and he affectionately quote unquote calls her his cat um it's like he looks at her as a pet and occasionally he sends orcs to her for her to eat um she doesn't find them very good eating because again nobody really does so a uh, golem will have like she knows that if she sees golem and then she sees frodo he's led he's leading frodo in there mm. as a, but golem's plan basically for a while now has been take her into the take frodo into the caves or frodo and sam let Shelob deal with them, and then um, I'll, the I'll, I'll take the ring from their clothes, yeah. But uh, Frodo s cuts himself out, and um, Pity st and, and Frodo and Gollum fight. Like, Gollum's got that great, like, wrestler off the top rope type shit going on. Yeah. But Pity stays his hand again. Ah, He can kill him, and he fucking doesn't. Same as Bilbo, man. I just want to point out, in the books as well, that Sam is here this whole time. He doesn't get told to go home. It's just they're both there. Right, okay. Um, but then we go back to, to, well, we go to the Rise of Rohan, where Eowyn's talking with Merry about how Merry doesn't feel like hobbits were made for great deeds, which is, is quite nice. Because we see that Merry and Pippin, like, we'll, we'll talk about them at the end, but they really do become two of the most, like, respected hobbits. Like, of the four that come back to the Shire, spoiler alert, um, of the four that come back to the hot like the Shire, they really are kind of like the more famous ones. Um because uh, like they come like so you've you've got they some They seem of, like they're more sociable though in They are, yeah. You've in got, the Shire. Yeah, pretty to much. To start with though. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. so you've got Sam who's a gardener, so like his like he's like a lower class, he's like a servant class almost in terms of hobbits. Um then you've got Frodo who's like this the the a uh, wealthy heir to Bilbo Baggins but then Merry and Pippin are from two big well respected families so um, Brandy Books and Tux um, and they come back but they also come back like when we see them them go back like Sam and Frodo are dressed nicely in that but Merry and Pippin have got on the fucking steward's armour of like Gondor and, and an esquire of Rohan Yeah. so um, yeah but uh, that's just as an aside um they then get the call to ride to Minas Tirith because the Rohirrim are making their way there as quickly as they can. And uh, Theoden saying that he wants to get there and still have like the strength to fight. Uh, and then I've just put in my notes. I can't remember this part of the film because I've just put in, wrote in my notes. Grond, 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 Grond. So I assume it has something to do with Grond at that point. That's when it I think it must be when it, 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 it's still breaking the door, right? Yeah. Because Gothmog's like, you know, get it. Um, but we see Pippin is at the top of the. He's in the courtyard of the White Tree, at the top of Gondor on the seventh level. When he sees Denethor leading a procession to put Faramir to rest, yeah. Um, and Denethor says that we won't go to the tombs together. Will um, like like the kings of old? They are going to burn. Like sorry, they're going to burn like the heathen kings of old. And we can like at this point. So I've got here in my notes that this is where Denethor's like fully accepted that he's mad now. What what did you think like? So you we were watching this you for the first time, Denethor leads Faramir out. Everyone like and Pippin's like he's still alive. What the fuck? But Denethor's gonna burn them both. Like what were you thinking watching that? It just highlighted like his disappointment with himself and also his son, um, and obviously they're not gonna get an honourable death. Well, that's what he believes. That's what he thinks. Yeah. So the next option is just to end it. Because mm. everything's already been a huge disappointment for him, so yeah, fair dude. Yeah, because he he does like he does shout like at some point like my line has ended. But yeah, it's it's it it's pretty dire for Minas Tirith at this point. Gandalf's trying to hold the line. Pippin's just trying to figure out what the hell he can do. But the the gates are breached as Grond comes in, and uh, <laughs> there's that line where Gandalf's like, no matter what comes through that gate, stand your ground. And then fully armoured trolls charge in, and you can see the look on Gandalf's face like, oh, fuck. Epic fight scene, right? Like, amazing fight scene. 
I do want to point out that I hated, I hated this level in the Return of the King GameCube game um, that was released like alongside the film. So frustrating. I played, I replayed it recently, Joe, you know, when I got my Steam Deck a few months ago, mm. um, and I was playing the Lord of the Rings games again. God, I hate that level so bloody much. It's just so frustrating. The camera angles are awkward. You've got all the, oh god, I'm fucking, I'm getting annoyed thinking about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I, what I like about Return of the King is, as we've mentioned it before, is that the stage has been set. Now we're just seeing it all play out. Yeah. And the fight, like I agree with you, like the fight scenes are just moi, amazing. <laughs> I love it. But I've also uh, I've noted that Gandalf during this fight is displaying again why he is a fighter and not a wizard. Um, so someone lied on their character sheet there. But we switch back to Frodo, who seems to have escaped from Shelob's caves and gets within sight of the watchtower of Kirith Ungol before Shelob stabs him uh, yeah. and starts wrapping him up for eating later. So at the time it looks like he's dead, but then we find out that actually no, Shelob um, likes to poison them and then until it's like a death-like put like sleep. And then she likes to play with her food before she eats it. Yeah. Um, which is alive and kicking. Chilling. Yeah, but it's exactly the same thing in um, Stephen King's It, which was so I don't know. Like I think Stephen King obviously would have read Lord of the Rings, and I do wonder how much of Pennywise's true form, which is a giant spider. Well, as close as our minds can make it out, it's a giant spider because really it's a it's an eldritch horror from beyond the universe that would drive you mad to see its true form. Um, look out for our podcast episode Nerd. on it. Yeah, right. I could talk all day about uh, about it. It's one of my favorite Nerd. books. Um, but I do wonder how much of inspiration did Stephen King take from Shelob when he was like writing it. He was on a fuckload of cocaine and that at the time and drinking, so it might have been nothing. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. But then again, it's not like Tolkien has a, a monopoly on giant spiders <laughs> eating. Shelob, strictly speaking, isn't even really a spider. She's a spider-like creature. So I think she's only got like six legs and she hasn't got eight eyes. She's got like two bunches of like dozens of eyes and she's got them on stalks. So the description is is different. Um, but it, it's the cl- closest approximation, again, is, is like a spider. But Sam shows up and he has the file of Galadriel and Sting. And uh, what he says, like, he's like, um, let go of him, you filth. It's just, just <laughs> peak Sam. Like, and, and again, this is, it's one of those things where Mary and Pippin, you can see outwardly, like, oh shit, they've done great things. Sam injures so badly that he might very well have killed a primordial being descended whose direct mother is like a spirit that existed on par with a Valar. And he wounds her so badly he might have killed her. And it's like, you poor, poor Samwise. <laughs> she doesn't get the recognition. He, well, he does get the recognition he deserves from me. <laughs> so I'm here every week talking about him. Um, but Sam performs a legendary feat and he wounds her so badly. So the thing is, it, when Shelob like, creeps back into the caves right at the end of their fight, um, Tolkien himself says that nobody knows if she later recovered and goes on a hunt. But it suffice to say that she passes out of this tale. Which is just like it's, it's probably one of my favorite parts is, is Sam fighting Sheila. But um, yeah, what what were you thinking when you were watching it, or was it just what what I've sorry as well? What I thought as well, um, rewatching this is I don't know whether it was because I was watching it with you and I was just like enjoying myself like uh, watching it. But it seems like a lot of the events passed a lot more quickly than I thought. Like in terms of it's like oh it's a short scene of Sam fighting Sheila and then it's over. Yeah, it feel, I, I feel like it's been a like, through all the films, I feel like it's very quick, um, which I suppose keeps your attention throughout like a long film. But it's like, oh, that seemed easy, like you were saying with Sam fighting, um, and and nearly killing her. It just seemed too quick for that to happen. Like the, you know, if you were playing top trumps. You would be quite low in the sort of fighting agility side of things. Mm. So you would expect a bit more of a tussle than what actually occurs. 
Um, I really like when she tries to stick a stinger in him. Oh, and he has to roll out. He's rolling. Yeah, he's rolling backwards and forwards. That was good. Yeah, that's um, pretty cool. But yeah, it just it felt like it was too quick. I know. It's over before you can start to enjoy it. Did you think that when Frodo's wrapped up in the spider webs that it looked like he was just covered in loads of like rubber bands? Like it looked like a rubber band ball to me. Which I once made at work when I worked for a solicitor. It just Oh, it just made me my stomach turn because it, it just oh, oh, oh. Yeah? Yeah. Just Do you not like rubber bands? Snotty. Oh, oh right, yeah. Oh fair dude. <laughs> Um, and I mean, he's like green. Yeah, he's he's fucked. He's he, fucked up. He is so white and green. He was white to start with. He's just he he almost turns into one of those ghosts. Well, that, white and green. Well, that's where he was going. Yeah. Um, that's what the the wound was doing to him in the fellowship before Elrond healed him. Um, and Arwen in the books rescued him. Uh, in the films rescued him, and Glorfindel in the. Is it Gloth? I think it's Glothindel. So he looks. looks even weirder than usual. Yeah, fair do. Um, but it's at that point that uh, Sam is hugging Frodo's body uh, and saying, well, he's, he's got tears in his eyes saying, don't go where I can't follow. Which is the first part. The Labrador. First part in the film where I started to tear up. Not the last, but it's the first <laughs> time. You're an emotional person. I really am recently. I'm just... It's just fucked. I am. It's uh, being a parent has just ruined me emotionally. Like you're coming up to thirty, your yeah. life's flashing before your eyes. Yeah, and it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I love my life. Um, Sting starts glowing, so Sam has to hide because the orcs uh, have come to see what the the, the kerfuffle is. Now, there's a whole thing missing from the films, which I say missing. It's just not included. Is there are three statues on the watchtower of Kirithongo and they watch the entrance into Mordor from Kirithongo. And they're not in the films because it would just I think it just kill the pace a bit. But basically they project like a force field of will that Sam has to struggle to get through and he has to use the fire of Galadriel to get through it. It's like an invisible barrier that he has to pass through to get into Mordor. And it alerts it's meant to just alert Sauron that like there's a like an, an intruder trespassers yeah pretty much um i it's probably just missing because it was too confusing you know you'd probably have to have like a visual force field of like green or something it might just look shit and uh, especially with the fact that the eye looks to scan anyway exactly yeah. when it's it's not that's it's more of an abstract concept because yeah. the eye doesn't exist so that, the, the eye's pretty much taken up that role isn't it that's a good point actually yeah that very well might be why. Yeah, the eye does that perfectly. Yeah, not a thought of that. That's good shit. See. Yeah. Um, Pippin, uh, we switch back to Gondor. Pippin uh, goes into Denethor, tells him that, you know, like Faramir is still alive and what have you. And um, Denethor grabs grabs him and starts sliding him along the floor and says, like, Pippin, uh, Peregrine, son of Paladin, I release you from Bugger my service. Off. Yeah, he says. I release you from my service. Uh, go forth and die in whatever way seems best to you. And he kicks him out. Because uh, Denethor starts to build a pyre. Yeah. Uh, and he's going to burn himself and Faramir alive. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty fucked up. So Pippin runs off, tries to find Gandalf. Who is uh, getting the... He's, out, he's sounding the retreat because things are fucking awful in Minas Tirith at the moment. And he's getting the women and children evacuated. Yeah. Something I'm not clear on is where they would be evacuated to because I, something tells me there'd probably be tunnels in the mountains that they'd have to go through. But part of the reason that Minas Tirith is so easily defensible is because of how hard it is to come over the mountains Yeah. behind them. And you see how big those mountains are, right? So who knows? Uh, but we see the battle scene continuing, showing uh, the, the savagery. And I don't know if you'd uh, saw, like, I don't know if you'd picked up on it, but it went on for so long that night has become day. Um, it's now daytime, like in the battle. But I thought the orcs couldn't travel in light. They couldn't. That's what uh, Mount Doom was erupting so much for, just to give them the ash and co- ash but cover and that. Then in the next bit, the sun comes out, doesn't it? It's just it's daytime. It's not like bright sun. But I think oh, if they're in the middle okay. of battle, like okay. it's just one of those things. But um, the Witch King of Angmar 
who's the leader of the Nazgul, confronts Gandalf with his uh, his flaming sword yeah. and <laughs> breaks Gandalf's staff. Yeah, which is dirty. <laughs> breaks, a, breaks a staff off in his ass. His flaming his flame sword. His flaming sword is bright red. Gets his flaming sword <laughs> But it's yeah, the the Nazgul. Um, so you see that Pippin draws his sword, but like just hearing the screech of the Nazgul, it really affects him. It it affects. He must have little ear holes. It, it no, it affects everyone. Um, it, it's everyone, because it's not pointed out much in the films, but a genuine power the Nazgul have is terror. Like their call demoralizes people really badly, and like it could cause trained soldiers to like break rank and flee. Because yeah. of the terror that they put forth, like it is one of their actual powers, is is is, is terror is terror, um, and we see that Pippin is struck dumb by it. But just as the Nazgul is about to strike, he's distracted by a very very familiar horn sound. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's the Rohirrim who have arrived. I want the only time I've heard J.R.R. Tolkien read Lord of the Rings was I heard him read read read. I once heard him read. The charge of the Rohirrim, and it was just amazing because it was like it was part of like a radio drama type thing, and he was reading it, and there was music in the background, and it was just fucking class. And you see that Gothmog is uh, you know, the the leader of the Orc army is like turning his ranks to face the Rohirrim because yeah. that they've flanked them from the side, and um, this is the first of two speeches that I'll read out. Um, from the films that are just fucking masterpieces. But uh, Theoden ma- rallies in front of everyone and says, Arise, arise, riders of Theoden. Spears shall be shaken, shields shall be splintered, a sword day, a red day, ere the sun rises. Ride now, ride now, ride. Ride for ruin and the world's ending. And Rohan charge uh mordor actually starts to break ranks of it is the the battle so the battle for pelinor fields now is on yeah it's proper on but um so as a as an idealistic uh boy who watched these and, and then read the books like i was just all over this shit like um having like honorable kind of like male figures i think speaks differently or perhaps spoke to me more as someone who didn't have like many male role models in his life so having people like reading about people like aragorn and theoden and shit like that you're just like i'll fucking die for you yeah um but what we are what were you thinking while we were watching this because obviously i was uh i had the i had the mop between my legs like i was pretending i was riding the cavalry <laughs> while we were watching this i was i was galloping my horse next to the telly it was beautiful it is a beautiful scene especially i love horses well, yeah, you said what? Did we, yeah, you said something about that as well, didn't you? While we were watching it, like how it made you feel. Just um, inspiring, weirdly, because we're never gonna we we don't come up against situations like that in real life. Um, you only ever see it in like storybooks and films. Um, but just physically, um, seeing sort of the charge into battle, and I'm a big history nerd, so that sort of thing. Gets me a going. Mm. You said it made you want to ride a horse really, really fast as well. Yeah. <laughs> Which I well, thought was funny. It, yeah, it's it's an amazing feeling going that fast. Yeah, so, well, I wouldn't know. I've only been on a horse once and we... It was just, just went round in circles. Yeah, no, no, it was when we were in Sioux City. Oh, no, I've been on a horse a couple of times. It was when we were in Sioux City yeah. in uh, Gran Canaria and I rode it up to the end and then back down again. Yeah. And I had to wait because I'm a big lad. I had to wait for the strong horse. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like fucking Henry the <laughs> Eighth. You would have probably been left behind in battle. Yeah, I would. I'd be on my donkey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the charge of the Rohirrim is just oh, again, it's just chef's kiss. It's beautiful. But Gandalf suddenly breaks into the the chamber. Yeah. Um, where Denethor reveals that he is utterly hopeless against Sauron. Standing uh, and, like a bird with his arms laid out. Yeah, and that, and that's what you said. Like you'd said um, that he he reached the end of all hope, essentially, hadn't he? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Gandalf and Shadowfax kick fuck out of Denethor, knock him out yeah. of the flames. But then 
He gets knocked back into the flames. Well, no. Um, at the same time, you've got um, Pippin. Pippin the Dave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, who like he does quite a action sort of shot there because he flings off the horse. Yeah, he jumps off the horse into the pyre. Into then... the pyre, and then he drags. Oh, I forgot his Faramir. name. Faramir. Faramir off the pyre. Yeah, yeah, he does, yeah. He makes sure he's safe, and then. Um... Faramir is like twice the size of him. Yeah, like well, I held, I would like we me and you were like running around with our daughter at Raby Castle, pretending to be horses while she was like our rider. Yeah. And at one point, I held her up and I said, "Like this is about the size of a hobbit." Because like it's just weird, isn't it? Like holding her as a person, yeah. holding up this like two feet tall creature and just being like, well, "I say it's a creature, it's our daughter." Um, but hold, I held her up and I was like, "This is about the size of a hobbit." Like say between two and four feet tall. I must have just got like a huge adrenaline rush. She's heavy, yeah. But could you imagine her pushing us out of bed, like rolling us out of bed? That that's essentially it. Well, I could actually because she's um... she's weirdly strong. Yeah. But yeah, like well, I was laid on the sofa today, and when I was like having a nap before I went for a run, yeah, she tried to roll you over. Yeah, and there. she like pulled back my t-shirt so she could give me a hug, yeah. and then. But, you know, well, that... she is quite strong, yeah, maybe. But no, I think um, that is quite a good moment for his character. It is, he's not as much of a div at this point. The div meter goes down, yeah. But uh, Faramir, uh, sorry, not Faramir, Denethor finally sees that he's alive, that yeah. Faramir is alive, he's like, no! and he catches fire. And run right, I, this is a bit of sneaky editing. So he catches on fire and it runs and it cuts, but then like oh, that courtyard, the yeah, that courtyard is fucking huge, right? He would have died long before that, but then he ends up tipping right off the top of Minas Tirith, and Gandalf just cold as ice is just and so passes Denethor, son of Ecthelion. Which That's is, like a massive hazard. Like, is that meant that gap meant to be there to kill people, off, push people off usually, or is it? I think it's just to piss off, you know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what it's for. Um, it freezes I, before it touches the ground. With Tolkien, right? I am absolutely. There will be an if it if it's there in the books. If it's there in the books, there will be there. It will be a reason. Like Lemba spreads. Just, it might just be everything. like we've just scratched the surface, and it turns out that is the star of the drainage system. Like, and that might be it. That might be a hole anyway. But um. As, I, I do like the way the camera pans because like it pans down because Denethor comes off the top and we pan back down to the Pelennor Fields, yeah. which uh, is raging um, because the Mumakil and the Harad uh, with the Haradrim arriving it's absolute carnage. Um, so the Oliphants like the gigantic yeah. elephant creatures. So I'm just going to put this out there, right? Peter Jackson just straight up lifted this from the Battle of Hoth. With uh, in the Empire Strikes Back, you know, with the AT ATs, yeah, like that's got to be it, right? You've got giant creatures being taken down by attacking their legs, that's fucking straight up. And I think at one point, someone cuts a rope and that causes like it gets its legs tangled, and that's how a Mumakil, like a, a, an, an Oliphant, dies or, or comes down. So, like, it's an amazing scene, but like, I don't know whether it's like. Because with filmmaking and that, it's rarely ever plagiarism. It's just an homage, isn't it? Like, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. But all I could think was, um, well, we I was all I could just think of with the Family Guy, of just dubbing it over with like Eowyn taking down a Mumakil, and just being like uh, Echo Seven. This is Carlos Spicy Wiener. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to point out as well, both Eomer and Eowyn, brother and sister, take down a Mumakil each. Call, so, calling back to their earlier conversation, uh, would you know where Eomer said war is no place for women? Yeah. There is definitely a place in war for women um, because she is on par with him there, pretty much, like, fair dues. Um, uh, how did you... F well, this is a bit of a leading question. What were your thoughts... No, fuck that, actually, no. I'm going to put my thoughts out there. At this point in the film, more than any other of any part of the films, could not help but appreciate the costumes and the props and everything. Like, I think the Battle of Pelennor Fields is when you get a really good look at all the armour of, like, the Rohirrim and that. Did that 
enter into like you watching like, at any point did you think oh wow they're, like it's really good armor and stuff or no no fair dues no i was like oh that's a cool idea with the tusks of the other oh ones. yeah 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 and the spikes and things and that chain from one tusk to the other they mm. like mowed loads of them down but yeah that was wicked yeah and just how powerful the oliphants are without really like they're just tools like they're getting driven in they're not i don't think they're necessarily sort of influenced to do that from own their own free will that they're not like oh yeah like they're just there to take anything down yeah, no, fair dues. But um, yeah, so we were watching both. Obviously, we're both watching this scene from different points of view. Because like, I've been there with like what you're saying of like, shit, this is so cool. And on a level, I still am like that. But now when I'm watching it, I'm just like, my God, these costumes are amazing. Like when I'm looking at like Theoden's sword and you see it's two horses, like the hilt of the sword is two horses with their heads touching. Uh, and I'm just watching it and I'm just like, my God, like Peter Jackson, like. Or, or well, sorry, like the, the the team behind like the costumes and props and everything, like they just went fucking above and beyond with all that stuff. Like it's absolutely amazing. Like so so much so that I mean, I've got like what what's mine? Like is my mine was mine used in the films? The Andrew role I got, or was it the same people who made them for the films? The sword I've got. I remember vaguely you telling me something to do with the films. But was it? I, I think it's like a movie grade prop, mine, perhaps. Okay. Um, but mine's like a, it's like a real, it's like an actual sword. It's not made of plastic. It's made of steel and stuff. To the point where I love having that. I'd love having that shit. Like if I could fill my office with Lord of the Rings memorabilia, I would. Like I've got a map of Eriador that we got from Rome. Yeah. Um, but it's just the swords the... from France. Is it? Mm. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. I'm a swordsmith in France. Oh well. Might not have been used in the films then, but um, fucking mint. Merry finds his courage in this battle, and he takes down quite a few um, few orcs. At one point, I think he like, jumps on one, doesn't he? It's like he jumps on it and like wraps his arm around its neck and is stabbing it in the chest, which is just class. Uh, but yeah, then he's not holding back. No, he's not. No, so like Merry and Pippin become two of the best warriors to ever come out of the Shire. Like, um, yeah, but Pippin's still not. Well, no, but. Before Merry and Pippin. He just kills one person each time mm-hmm. and then no. goes off like, yeah. No, he, sa- he saves Gandalf's life. And, yeah, yeah, but it's like, oh, yeah, job done. I see you later. Mm. Done my bit. But um, he, he does more. he's done more than us. Um, but the last big war- uh, Hobbit warrior, I think, before them two, was Bull Roarer Tuck, who there was a goblin invasion. And Bull Roarer Tuck was so tall for a Hobbit that he could ride a horse. He once, yeah, this is in the, so Bull Rora took once, uh, was in for a goblin charge and cut the head off a goblin that flew clean off and flew so many meters away in the air before going down a hole in a tree. And so he won the battle and invented the game of golf in the same day. <laughs> and that, that was Bull Rora took, um, so that's Pippin's ancestor, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, he might be a div, but he's from a family of not divs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, so Bull Roarer, uh, you know. Pippin says that he, he didn't, he, there's a bit of a lull where him and Gandalf are looking out over the battle. And Pippin says he didn't think it'd end like this. And Gandalf has that lovely kind of comforting speech. Where it hasn't ended. He says, yeah, he says, like, death isn't the end. It's just another path that they all must take. And what's interesting is. Do you know the description he gives where he says, like, um, well, you might not remember because at this point we had to turn the TV up because the dog was fucking snoring so loudly. Um, but Gandalf says, you know, you see the misty curtain of rain pull back and the grass stretches forever, like the, the grass stretches on or something. What is interesting there is that is pulled from the books, but that is what Frodo and Bilbo see when they go to the west at the end. So what Gandalf is describing there isn't what any mortal, like Hobbit or man or dwarf... Who, That's as close as what he would... Well, he yeah. understands is what they're going to say. Yeah, but... So nobody knows what happens to the like the people who have the gift of Iluvatar when they die, because they leave the circles of the world entirely. They go to the timeless halls, as far as we know. Yeah. 
Um, so what Gandalf is describing is is accurate to the book, but he's telling it to someone who will never see that because Pippin will never go to the West. When Pippin dies, Pippin will go beyond the circles of the world, just like every other mortal. Yeah. So it's, it's oh well, it does the trick. He he feels much better. He does. He he does. He does. The next scene we see this um, this this comfort might be needed because it's uh, Theoden is wounded very badly when uh, his horse rears up and falls on him. Um, and as the Witch King approaches Eowyn as Durnhelm, bravely confronts him and they do battle. Um, she kills the Naz- uh, the the fell beast, and but she gets Lopping her. Off its head. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really quick how it happens, isn't it? It's like she just dodges to the side and cuts his fucking head off. Um, which is awesome but then as they're fighting she gets her arm pretty much crippled uh, by his flail which we see it's not just a physical wound it's kind of it's just like any wound made by a mogul weapon yeah it's uh, it's really bad but then we switch again and the black ships of the Corsairs arrive and the orcs giving a big in saying like pirate scum always lay blah 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 but there are no pirates it's just uh, Aragorn Gimli Legolas Big fucking ghost army, huge. As they start to swarm, and this is again, it's just, it's just rapid back and forth storytelling. But uh, the Witch King tells Eowyn that uh, no man can kill her, and Merry stabs the Witch King with a dagger in the leg. Now, in the films, this is just a dagger, right? Typically, however, in the books, it's not just a dagger. There is a person missing from the films entirely, called Tom Bombadil, who, like Ungoliant, exists outside of all-known creation, except Tom is far from evil. Um, we could do a whole episode on Tom Bombadil. Um, we probably should, just to, to, to go over it, because it's completely mystifying who he is. Um, all these years later, no one's able to determine who exactly Tom is. Um, but the Hobbits meet him in the books. And he rescues them after they leave. they meet him like pretty much at the start of their journey in the old forest where there's um, the who owns the trees, um, trees like the ones that are angry, and he saves them from the trees from a tree called Old Man Willow, and Tom and his wife, um, I think she's called Goldberry. I think oh, it's been a while, uh, but Tom always sings like he sing he's sing songy guy. It's great, but he uh, he sends them on their way again. And he then rescues them from a barrow down, which is like a grave, which is haunted by an evil spirit. And he gives them daggers to take with them. And that's kind of like far reaching because those daggers that they're given by Tom Bombadil when he recovers them from one of the graves are forged. They were forged long ago to fight the Witch King in the north of Angband when the Witch King was a man. So Jeez. that dagger, yeah, that dagger has come all this way and all these years later when the Witch King has had this prophecy made about him that he can't be killed by any man and Mary stabs him with the dagger which breaks the spell keeping him like from being killed allowing Eowyn to rip off her helm to state that she is no man and she kills the Witch King of Angmar which is um you know Sauron's greatest servant yeah so it's it's a it's almost criminal that's missing from the films because Mary it in the films it just looks like Mary stabs him with a, a regular it's dagger a as a distraction and then he just he gets absolutely fucked up from it when in reality well not in reality but in the book sorry Mary stabs the witch king with a dagger that the witch king thought was all gone or accounted for that was made thousands of years ago to specifically fight him yeah. um it's just like well eowyn's uh it's all fucked up after she kills the witch king and gothmog is heading her way and she's you know when she's trying to crawl yeah. away i felt really like tense like that when she's like scrambling trying to get away because she's proper messed up but luckily aragorn uh, and gimli kill him yeah it just run past they do yeah it's just i do you know it. um I... which i liked because it wasn't as if he was doing it like, I thought, oh, they're going to do the romancy thing. Like, she's going to be like, oh, he saved me. But it wasn't. It was just like, right, just doing my thing, running through, killing. I told you, like... He was doing it. He, it wasn't specifically for her. Was he wasn't just, doing it for the air, was he? just... No, and she slaying wasn't... Slaying things. 
He's just running through. Yeah, it's just he, he wasn't bothered about the Aosu. She's not bothered about the Aragusi. Oh, don't use them words. <laughs> um, but then, yeah. So, uh, did you notice how much like dismemberment there seems to be in these scenes? I, I forgot about all this, but like Gothmog gets his arm chopped off. Um, and you see, there's people like the soldiers of Rohan and that have got their arms missing, and just shit I'd never noticed, which is weird. Like I don't know why I glossed over all that, but it just seems mad. Like that there's a bit. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing from your look, you didn't pick up on it. I would think that would be weird though, because they're swinging the swords around. They're not like just going straight in, are they? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like it does make sense, like, but it's just for the tone of the films. Like I was just I wasn't expecting I I I don't know why I'd phased it out of my mind that there was any dismemberment, but <laughs> Aragorn, uh, sorry, Gimli and Legolas are having their um, they're having their competition when Legolas is asked very kindly to dispatch uh, one of the Oliphants. Yeah, he goes and he does his Tony Hawk's moves. <laughs> you said at the time, didn't yeah, you? You're like, I when this came out, was Tony Hawk's really popular? And I was like, well, yes, it was actually. <laughs> yeah, the amount of like skateboarding esque movements he does. See, you say skateboarding, I think Fred Flintstone, um, where he slides. So at the beginning of the Flintstones, like credits, uh, the the intro, he, at one point he slides down like a brontosaurus and into his car. So that's <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Like, so you see, like Tony Hawk. Yeah, you see a skateboarder. I see fucking Fred Flintstone. Um, but Gimli very calmly. <laughs> that still only counts as one. Speaking of which, who do you think's winning up to now? The uh, the 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 kill count. Uh, Legolas. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, because but, uh, while Gimli's swinging his axe about, yeah. Legolas has shot about five arrows. So Yeah, but... but uh, He's also olif- took all the people off that elephant. But it still only counts as one. You heard no, the ruling. No, no, no. You're full of shit. People who are losers make excuses and additional rules and things like that. It so... is just one elephant, though. Oliphant. It's just one elephant, though. No, but he's shot people... He hasn't just felled an elephant and it's... I don't know what this elephant is that you're talking about, but we're talking about (laughs) oliphants. He hasn't just felled this oliphant and the people have died because they fell off it. He has killed additional people before the elephant even was knocked over. Yeah, no, that will count as kill count. Like, I think directly killed by them, not because of falling, but because of, like, pew-pew arrows to the face plus the elephants. But that also brings into question how many people can he really shoot with his arrows because how does he keep up with all these arrows? I think there's a lot of like Does he just Legolas, magic them I think, I think there's a lot of like Legolas pulling arrows out of people's eyes that we're not seeing. I thought you were going to say out of people's asses there. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't think You're just you'd, pulling that out of your ass. I don't think there'd be much... Um, I don't think it's very fatal to get an arrow head to the arse meat. Uh, I mean, I won't try if you are, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> that still only counts as one. <laughs> but yeah, I think definitely Legolas. Oh well, um, I'm sick of all you elf lovers out there. I'm a I'm a dwarf. Full of... Do you know my D and D character was a dwarf, and he had the most fleshed out backstory I've ever had for a character. He, he died he, within one week or something. He died in the second fucking session because of an elf. He was being cheeky when elf got him tied up and she slit his throat. So now I'm a halfling who uses frying pans as weapons. That's an actual rule in Pathfinder. Is this podcast just to confirm how nerdy you are? How do I even answer that? It's a Lord of the Rings podcast. Well, I just I feel like the motivations have re- really changed because... Um, you're just flexing all this knowledge about other things as well as Lord of the Rings now. I think anyone who plays with me would disagree that it's knowledge, because considering I don't know the rules half the time we play. <laughs> um, anyway, we see that the ghosts, again, it, it's not made as big of a deal in the films. Like You just see the ghosts wash over everyone. Yeah, I like that touch. It's like a swarm of bees. Yeah, exactly. that is exactly... Or a pre- mist. Yeah, it's pretty much what it is like. 
Um, they clean house. They sweep over the Pelennor fields and up through Minas Tirith. And, and all's quiet. Yeah, it's kind of like, but that's like that's it. The battle's over. Which I don't know. It just seems like I don't know. It just seems like a quiet ending to a big battle. I, it's weird, but um, you know. Anyway, we see um, that Eowyn gets the Theoden, and they have quite a touching moment where um, Theoden says he goes to his fathers, who he's not afraid to stand in their presence anymore because he's died like a king. Yeah. Um, and he also he pulls out a Theodinism of instead of saying, I recognize you, he says, I know your face. Um, something I, w- I like to use. That's a lie. I've never used it. I'd sound massively. Want to use it. I, I want to use it, but I'd sound like a massive weirdo if I just went, I know your face. It belongs in my. It belongs on my la- washing line. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's just Aragorn. Uh, so after after Eowyn and, and Theoden say goodbye, um, Eowyn like collapses. She's just like, oh, I'm fucked. Aragorn does the honourable thing and releases the ghosts, and he holds their oaths fulfilled. And you see all of them disappear. Now they are able to do what the Witch King has done. Um, and they pass beyond the circles of the world, and they go to join Eru in the Timeless Halls, which is what they've been wanting to do for thousands of years now. But well, he's like, uh, they're very useful. Yeah, he's saying like you could keep using them and keep using it and keep using them, but Aragorn is an honourable man. Yeah, he's king. We see. Um, then we see Eomer a- finds Eowyn, and he just. Carl Urban put like 110% into that scene. I completely forgot about it. Do you know when he's like, ah, like just weeping and crying? Yeah, I was like, like that, Baha- that Bahamian wall of hollering. Yeah, like I had to check with you oh, what, yeah. what the relationship was. I was like, <laughs> you're like, who's that again? I was like, it's a brother. brother yeah, it's a brother. Yeah, it's not like the well, Lannister. I did know who they were. Right. Okay. Yeah. But not... I just wanted to confirm it because I was like, eh? Like... Yeah, brother and sister. Um, We see Aragorn then heal her and again it's not made as big of a deal in the books as it is uh, sorry it's not made as big of a deal in the films as it is in the books the hands of the king are the hands of a healer that is how aragorn is known to be the heir of a sealed or he can heal okay um so there's there's like whole scenes in the books where he's talking to like the chief medic or whatever the term for it is in gondor um and he's like asking for king's foil and stuff like that so he can heal people because he goes around treating the wounded. Yeah. Um, it's just not made a big of a deal, just except this one scene in the extended version. But in the aftermath, we see Eowyn and Faramir meet for the first time. Oh, yeah. That Faramussy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just, like, you can tell straight away. It's like they've got oh, that. It's just so cringe. It's mint. Like, finally. She found Puts someone. hope in all those little teenagers' minds, you know, the, when you, you like, casting glances over the room at your crush and you think that's how relationships work. Well, oh. yeah, I mean... Oh. I don't disagree. However, in the books, they have a lengthy convalescence together. They both have to heal up and they're not allowed to leave, basically, like, the doctor's wards. The hospital wards of Gondor. So every day they spend as much time as they can together because they're the only company they've got. Yeah. Because uh, so uh, as we skip ahead, like I'll skip ahead and then we'll come back. But as they're recovering together, Aragorn, uh, the princes of Dol Amrath, and, and Gandalf, and, and everyone else, they've all left yeah. to go to Mordor, and that takes days. So there, Faramir and Eowyn are pretty much all the only two. That's how they get annoyed. They're, they're in confined, like, space, you know, they're, they're together. And of course, Peter Jackson had to condense all this into one scene. It was like, just fucking look at each other. Yeah. I'll put some, I'll put some, Vasel- so, I'll put some Vaseline on the camera lens. So cringe. Yeah, but, uh, Faramussi is, uh, is a good one. Uh, we also see that Pippin finds Mary and says they look after him, which is nice because, like, and it also kind of brings it home as well. That Pelennor Fields is massive. Like he must, yeah, Pippin he spends, must have been out there for yeah, ages. It's dark. It's yeah. It's, it's getting dark, isn't it? 
Yeah, and there's all those bodies, and he was only about 10 feet away from him, and he still couldn't see him for ages. Yeah. When he does find him, which is just like, boom. Um, but yeah, that that's the aftermath of the battle. We then see Frodo wakes up at the top of the tower of Kirith Ungol, and uh, there's, there's two orcs rifling through his things, and an argument breaks out of the... Is it an orc? Is it not an orc in there, one of those... Well, I thought it was, I always thought it was orcs, but you're right because one does look like an uruk, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I always thought it was the two factions of orcs were the ones from Mordor, like as in within Mordor, and then orcs from Minas Morgul, which is you know that city that the Witch King comes from. Yeah. Oh, he's he's taken over. But basically, an argument breaks out, which then becomes a fight, which then becomes a fucking riot. It's just these people are always on a knife edge. Like, could you imagine? If orcs discovered caffeine as well. <laughs> like, could you imagine, like, you walk into a bloodbath and... Um... They don't hold grudges because they don't let it become a grudge. You know, it doesn't... <laughs> the anger doesn't... <laughs> I don't hold grudges because I kill people at the yeah, first sign of exactly. inconvenience. Yeah, it's just, all I imagine when I was watching this is... Um, just, like, imagining orcs with caffeine and just being, like... Um, I ordered a f- fucking cappuccino. This is a latte. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting fucking stabbing each other to Your death. Your mind <laughs> really challenges me. <laughs> well, the idea of orcs in a cafe or an orc cafe. I just never. That would never cross my mind. It's just being being shanked to death by an L-shaped blade, while while someone's repeating like a cappuccino is half form. <laughs> Uh, but, <laughs> well, in the <laughs> aftermath of all this fighting over cappuccinos, um, Sam sneaks into the tower and he uses the shadows. Did I, I, it seems weird that that just comes from nowhere. Yeah, he uses his shadow to look like a big being coming towards the orcs to scare them, but then just runs out anyway. <laughs> yeah, so in the books, though, Sam's got the ring and Sam uses the ring. I, th- I think he uses the ring. Anyway, I know Sam's tempted by the ring, but the ring tempts him. Sauron, like, the ring tempts him by showing him a garden that covers all of Middle-earth. And he's just like, oh, no, it's too big for me. <laughs> and that's how, like, it's just like, no. Oh. I couldn't manage that sort but of just, man how, how pure of a person do you have to be that the ring that can c- corrupt and, like, corrupt people of all races to your side with power and promises of power to him is just like, have a big garden and he's like nah I'm alright uh, but yeah he uh, he fights his way through uh, uh, and in the books he only finds Frodo by because Sam for some reason just bursts into song because um, of our desperation and co- like just grief he starts singing and like Frodo hears and starts singing back right, okay. like really faintly and that's how he knows where, where he is Um but I love when Sam's killing three orcs and he's like, for the Shire, for Frodo, for my old gaffer. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking great. He rescues Frodo, which is, woo, that's awesome. However, not as awesome. It means that they still need to go on into Mordor. Um, and Frodo apologises. So Frodo apologises for being a dick this whole time. Then immediately undoes it by yeah. snatching the ring back straight away. It's like, yeah. But then he kind of like softens as well. And you see like Frodo is trying so hard when he explains that it has to be him. And it does. Like there is no one else in Middle Earth who could have done this job. And it has to be Frodo Baggins. But I want to point out that Sam is only the second person in history to give the ring back willingly. And he gives it back much more willingly than Bilbo did. Yeah. Sam just there you go, Paul. And then he looks at it, he's like, Could I have a big garden? No, no, there you go. You know, you know, he's thinking about that garden. But uh <laughs> no he gives it back, but like Yeah, they, again. I've got more sympathy for Throdo now in the at the end of this. Because you see just how much effort it's taken. Mm. And it, it it destroys him so much as a person, he has to he has to leave Middle Earth. Do you know what I mean? Like Yeah. Um, but they, they get going. Um, they've got some orc disguises this time, though, with uh, some pots and pans. And... So, yeah, yeah, 
It's just it's just all like cast iron and shit, isn't it? Like with orcs, you just know it's heavy. Now we've got Gan then we switch back to Gandalf, Gimli, Legolas, Aragorn, and Eomer, who is now king of Rohan. Um, they're discussed now. They can give Frodo more time because they well, Frodo needs time. And we also see that in the we saw that Frodo and Sam have got to get through the plains that's filled with all the orcs of Mordor. And before they left, Aragorn puts his hand on the sword. The four. Yes, um, because yeah, they, they are discussing not to give Frodo more time, and Aragorn says we need to draw him forth and keep him distracted while Frodo does his job. And he does this uh, just exactly like you say by uses a palantir. Uh, and he calls Sauron out. Yeah, like absolutely. Um, he shows Sauron and Duril, um, who in turn shows him Arwen dead. Like, why not? Yeah, just what the fuck? <laughs> it's just so weird. Um, yeah, just He's trying to get him where it hurts. Yeah, yeah, weird. Um, but the the host set forth, um, and that leaves Eowyn and, and Faramir to flirt like fuck and start holding hands. I feel a bit shit for saying this, right? But Eowyn went for the king and got the steward. So, still respectable. However, imagine being a villain in Gotham City and you're committing crimes to try and draw up Batman, but he just sends Robin to deal with you. Yeah. Like, you'd be fucking gutted, wouldn't you? Like, I'm not even worth... Well, she must be getting a good dickin'. Well, yeah, she must be getting... Uh, yeah, she must be getting... Her one ring destroyed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a pure love story. Um, it's just you know, like I I I kind of feel like um, like Tolkien work sometimes it needs this lev this kind of levity because it's all too often you come across people who treat it like it's the holy scripture, and that's fine and it has its place. And I've got utmost respect for the writings and it like it will last my lifetime studying his works, right? My whole life, I'll, in some form or another, I'll always be learning something about Tolkien. Yeah. But at the same time, like you, you need to inject some levity into it. Because, you know, why not? Um, but we see Frodo and Sam falling with a company of orcs who are being whipped towards the Black Gate because their armies are being mustered. And this is about the time. In, it's not mentioned in the films, but in the books, this is about the time where they're all heading to like the, the, the host from Gondor are heading towards Mordor, and as they get past Minas Ithil, or Minas Morgul, as it's now called, um, some of them get scared um, uh, and want to like turn around. And Aragorn treats them with such kindness and compassion and says that any man who wants to turn away, because you've been marched towards almost certain death, any man who wants to turn away, I won't think any different of you. But I would say that, you know, if you want to stay, please stay. And that... He's so, he's so kingly and compassionate that some of the men whose hearts were failing with fear actually decide to stay and carry on. Some of them still do leave, but like out of like shame and fear and stuff. But it just, yeah, just Aragorn is just good king. <laughs> I'm obsessed with his chef's kiss this episode. I don't know why. I, know. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, but Sam and Frodo start a fight and then duck out the line. Which I, I never understood. I didn't understand that scene. Like, that orc that just looked at them. Yeah, looks at them as if he notices yeah, that like, they're not orcs. Yeah, what was all that about? But then doesn't press it. Yeah. I mean, but do you know who, uh, that big fat orc, like, with the one eye? Do you know who he mm. made me think of? Do you know when I send you those memes, that's like, eight sangria, eight foreigners, love me chips, simple <laughs> as. It just, it just made me think of him. <laughs> <laughs> Like eight elves, eight dwarves, eight men love Sauron. Simple as. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Frodo. He did look like one of the Mitchell brothers. Yeah, <laughs> just stand there and look hard. <laughs> All right, but uh, Frodo and Sam duck out the line. They head back towards Mount Doom, also known as Orodruin, also known as Amon Amrath, um, because as you can tell in the Gondorian language. Hill or mountain is Amon. I'm on a big hill. <laughs> <laughs> no, Amon is the is the is the, the actual word. Um uh, but things are dying now. Uh and you can see that like Sam and Frodo are really fucking depressed and as and, and all hell. Until Sam sees Erendil the Mariner through the clouds, the star. 
Um, and he says, like, look, the, up there, there's light and beauty that no shadow can touch, which um, it is amazing. But then knowing the, like, I've told you about Erendil and Mariner, right? He's up there. That yeah. star is actually someone, an immortal person up there with the Silmaril riding yeah. around the sky. And I read a comment on Reddit that said, uh, <laughs> Mr. Frodo, I saw Mr. Elrond's dad flying a giant ship carrying a Silmaril. And I was like, Sam, what have you been smoking? <laughs> but I know the, the forces are mustered outside the Black Gate now, so we're coming towards the, we're coming towards the end. Did you feel a, a sense of palpable excitement here? I fucking did. Um, yes, because I just, um, I kind of wanted the Frodo to be over, really. Yeah, it does feel like a lot of teasing at the end, doesn't it? It's like, just it just in it's it's like uh, I imagine that must be. It's frustrating because he gets a little bit, and then, and I think because the because of the films being so fast and you, like flipping between scenes, you don't, um, you you forget how far he's journeyed, so yeah. he seems a bit annoying because you're like Sam's still going, like Sam's friggin' carrying you at one point. But Sam doesn't have the ring. I know, but like you. But you're still in your head. You're like, come on. Yeah, it's just you're so close. It's so hard to 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 overstate kind of like how corruptive and corrosive the ring is. Um, but yeah, Frodo slipping the ring almost has him. Like he's he's at the end of all things here. Um, but then we we go back to Aragorn and co- company who were mustered outside the Black Gate, and I I like. Do you remember me saying when I used to work in a call centre that there was that manager who would rally me with, like, Lord of the Rings speeches? Yes. Phil. Uh, Phil Sugden. <laughs> Shout out, Phil. I've never spoken to him for about ten years, but are you? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Aragorn's like, let the, Lord of the Black, uh, let the Lord of the Black Land come forth so that justice may be done upon him. Which, I don't know why I'd ever use that in day. There's so many Aragorn quotes I want to use in my day-to-day life, but I just don't have... If I shouted, let actually, if I shouted, let the Lord of the Black fan, Land come forth, I'd probably be. It probably could be like a hate crime somewhere, unless the policeman was also a or police officer. Sorry, was also a fan of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I, I don't, don't find there'll be any situation that you'll need that line for. To be honest. Aye, but uh, the person who does come forth. Uh, well, I'll ask you before we go into it. What did you think of uh, the person who came forth on the horse from the from Mordor? When the gates opened. Really cool. Like a Stranger Things type of being. Aye. Stranger yeah. Things. Yeah, Alien. Loved it. It was a bit sort of sci-fi for me, so yeah, ah. really, really like that character. And really like sassy and kind of... Yeah. Like, like you always have at least one kind of being within battles and things that's kind of just like chill. and mm. Just like... It's a big laugh to him. It seems like it's a big joke. Um, he was a bit of a bastard, really wasn't he? Yeah. And they're the most dangerous people. So they're the people that mm. say things that aren't true. Or... Well, he does in this case, yeah. yeah. But um, what the mouth of Sauron, as that's his official title, is the mouth of Sauron. Um, he is a black Numenorian. And a black Numenorian, nothing to do with skin colour, but it is one of the ones, uh, one of the Numenorians who Aragorn is descended from who worshipped Morgoth and were corrupted by Sauron. So if you remember when we talked about Numenor previously, what happens is Elendil, the Sealdor's dad, and Anarion and Isildur, his sons, left Numenor as they were called what they were what was called the Faithful. So they left Numenor before Numenor was sank under yeah. the waves. And they were the they stayed true and faithful to the Valar, and worshiping Eru Iluvatar and what have you, whereas the other Numenorians had been corrupted by Sauron or were helped along by Sauron into um, worshiping Morgoth, and they practiced like human sacrifice and stuff. So basically, before Numenor got sank, they went from the best of men to the worst, and they bec- they went from great kings to great tyrants. So. Uh, Aragorn is descended from the people who were like, fuck that, and left for Middle-earth. Yeah. This black Numenorian is one of the ones who 
is either was there a Numenor and left, or descended from people who still worship Morgoth and then left uh, survived the fall of Numenor. Mm. Um, but Sauron taught this one like sorceries and magic and tricks and, and what have you. And he's so old that he doesn't even know his name. I think I, it sounds like something I've read, but it could be something I've made up. But I'm pretty sure he doesn't know his own name, the Black Numenorian, because he's that old. Uh, but he shows Aragorn and company the mithril shirt and says that Frodo, or the, the halfling, suffered greatly at the hands of the host. Yeah. Which he didn't. It's just a lie to trick to, to dishearten them. Um, it obviously works a little bit because Aragorn beheads the mouth, which is, as much as I agree with it, and I've been like, yeah, as a king, that's kind of like bad crack. Because, like, it's it's always been, historically, it's always been a great crime to harm messengers. Mm. So he was, at that point, a messenger. So it's just, mm, you know, but what were your thoughts on it? I just thought, like, he's just like, oh, I'm sick of your shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck this. <laughs> um, and just did what quite often I feel like doing to people, just being like, just shut up. <laughs> and also, like, that would, the other men would be able to hear, so it would, like, scare off and kind of, it would, it would end their motivations to keep going. So I, mm. I understand if, and wanting to just stop that there and then and be like, nah. What other crap are you gonna spout next? Yeah, so, no, yeah, like he he was just talking mad shit, like. And Aragorn's like, it just Aragorn's like, I don't believe it. So. There's Keep a. Going. There's there's one quote from that Black Numenorian that occasionally pops into my head at work, which is like, if I get invited to a call and I'm not sure why I need to be there, um, very occasionally in my head I just think of that guy and I'm like. Is there any amongst this rabble who has the authority to treat with me? <laughs> and I, I just, you know, there's, there's a time and a place, Chris. There's a time and a place. But you can't stop me thinking that shit. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's gone. He's dead. And then uh, Aragorn comes back and makes uh, a very, well, this is the speech for me. This is the speech. And the speech goes, hold your ground. Hold your ground. Sons of Gondor, of Rohan, my brothers. I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields, when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West. It's just, it's not even in the books. But uh, probably the best addition to uh, to the films, I think. But uh, then, what, what, well, I mean, obviously I gush over this, but uh, what did you think when you were watching it? Um. It's just like the last sort of stand, mm. and even if all hope's gone, um, it's trying to instill that last bit of kind of like, right, this is it. Like everything you've been through has led to this one moment, so we either get through it, um, one way or another. Really, and it's like the it's the Theoden question every time, like. He's always being questioned throughout, like, are you going to support, are you going to fight, mm. or are you going to just watch? You... But ultimately, he doesn't really have a decision because it's the end of the world, potentially. Right? Yeah, that's, that's it. It's like, as they know it, it would be the end of the world as they know it, and that's all right, and that's all right. Uh, I, can't, I can't say it without thinking about the song. Uh, but Gimli and Legolas have a friendship goals moment. Where Gimli says, uh, I never thought I'd die, I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. And then Legolas says, well, what about with a friend? And he says, I could do that. Aye, I could do that. It was the second time I teared up. Oh. Uh, while watching this film. 
Uh, but then we go back uh, and then we come back. We'll come back the third time um, when Sam reminds Frodo about the Shire and all the good things. And he says, you know, like the the, the taste of strawberries and it's it's nearly springtime now because this is March that yeah. it's happening in, um, which is when we're recording this, which is fun. Um, he's saying, like, do you remember the taste of strawberries and, and the, you know, like the, the, the feel of the wind and, and stuff like that? And Frodo can't remember any of this. He's just wandering in the darkness. Yeah. And all he can feel is the, the you know, the, the, the ring and the eye on him. It's the ring is completely drained him and Sam has his uh has a, another hero moment. But probably the, the Sam's most quoted moment is like, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. And he picks Frodo up as uh they go. And then and, by this point we're just sobbing. I mean, yeah, I was just, I was just fucking tears streaming down my face. Like, do you know what? Let's normalize, let's normalize men crying for heroic deeds of Samwise Gamgee. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's talk about how good of a person Sam is. Do you know what? Like, honestly, um, everyone needs a Sam friend. Yeah, like I, like honestly, I grew up in like, like such a really rough area with like such absolute fucking reprobates, and then I, I've had a kid and then. Like I've, I've built a life for myself that I love, so I'm comfortable enough in my life to say I cr- fucking cry watching Lord of the Rings. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I feel how I feel. If I want to enjoy these things, I will. You ain't doing shit to me. Um, but I uh, then the the battle is so the black gates open. The whole of Mordor pours out. It's empty. Um, it, well, it was already empty by the time we get to yeah, Sam and Frodo. Circle, it's it's kind of like non chronological a bit, like as we're taking notes here, because it's just so fucking back and forth. But basically, the the army have surrounded them already. Yeah. And uh, I sent you this meme today, didn't I, actually, where Aragorn says for Frodo, and then there's like just two regular soldiers in the Gondorian army, right. just like who the fuck's Who's Frodo? That? Yeah. <laughs> but I, uh, the last battle, the battle, the last battle begins. Um, and as it the, the carnage goes there, Merry and Pippin run out. Like they're the second people out. Like Aragorn runs out, then Merry and Pippin, and then everyone else must feel ashamed. Like, oh god, look at those two little dudes just fucking <laughs> belting it. Um so everyone else t- overtakes them, but let's not forget that they charged straight yeah. after Aragorn. Um but Gollum makes an appearance and jumps them on Mount Doom as we switch back to Sam and Frodo. Um he tries to kill Frodo again until Sam bashes his head with a rock. And it's it's utter chaos now, my notes. Like, utter fucking chaos. Because uh, the eagles arrive, um, which is Gua here. So I was a bit confused, um, my, just in myself and my own knowledge, because there's two leaders of the eagles that I know of. There's Gua here and there's Thorondor. And Thorondor is the leader of the eagles in the first age of Middle-earth. But I think Gua here was there as well. Uh, in the first stage of Middle Earth, and basically the Eagles are the messengers of Manwe, who is the chief of the Valar. Right. And the Valar know what Eru Iluvatar, God, wants, or when they want to speak to him, by speaking to Manwe, who sits at the top of his mountain and looks deep within inside himself, and he that's where he can talk to Eru Iluvatar a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, the, the Eagles are there and they fight the Nazgul and I will say this the Eagles are I don't know whether this is a thing about pride or a thing about the way that pride is written but the Eagles are written as very proud creatures which a lot of the time translates to them just being fucking assholes and I've never come across a prideful character that's written written in a way that you'd say yes he's prideful instead of saying he's an absolute dick or she I just I don't know what it is about humans and writing pride, and I don't think I'm explaining myself well. But I used to be a lot more prideful than I was than I am now. Like I, I was literally like the type that I'd swallowed blood before I swallowed my pride. But I don't think I've ever been an out and out asshole, despite being a very proud person. There are times when I am an asshole, but <laughs> I, I saw your eyebrows go up there. Um, I don't know. It's just I, every time someone's written as prideful. They just come off as a dickhead as if the author doesn't know the difference. And I, I, I don't know, it's just it's a very tricky... I don't know um, what what the Eagles have done to you, to be honest, because <laughs> they've 
as far as I see, they, they just come swooping in, helping. Well, yeah, but in the books they talk. Um, I don't know whether they it's talk a, mad shit. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether it's a Hobbit. I don't know if it's Lord of the Rings, but in one of the Tolkien books, they start saying shit like, "Like you're a burden," or like I wouldn't carry you as a burden too far. We're not pack animals. Blah 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 blah. Like they're basically they're just fucking wankers. Um, but that might be my interpretation of it. But again, I, but that's just something else. Like in Warhammer Forty K, there's a um, there's a, a a son of the emperor. Uh, sorry, there's a space marine chapter called the sons. Of, not chapter. There's a space marines legion, the third legion called the sons of the emperor. And there's a very very prideful warrior called Lucius, who is like one of the best swordsmen ever in the the whole universe. And in the novels, he's just written like a straight dickhead. He's just he's very prideful, but it just comes off as absolute wankers. So, I don't know. might just be me trying to split hairs where being an arsehole, being prideful, in it does make you an arsehole. I don't know. Fuck knows. That's just my musings on uh, pride. Anyway, the eagles are here. <laughs> <laughs> and they fight the Nazgul. Um, and, and that's, you know... We get to the end of the road for Frodo. And I want to be careful how I, I'm, I say this as someone who, like as you have only watched the films. Frodo was he fails here at the end, right? You saw you yeah. see that where he claims the ring. Frodo was always gonna fail here, right? Yeah. But that wasn't what the purpose of the journey was. It wasn't about having someone who could get there and throw the ring in the fire. And that be the end of it. It was that this ring would corrupt whoever it was, regardless. The point was to get here. That was it. The whole point was to get here. Nobody would have been able to give up the ring, but Frodo's the only person in Middle Earth who would have been capable of getting there where he needs to be. He needs to be in this chamber, and that's where the ring. So he can he can claim the ring now, but it it was about getting this far. So he was always going to fail. Yeah. And he couldn't have not. But um, as Frodo claims it, Sauron very fucking suddenly realises what the plan was all along. Because Sauron had always thought that if anyone finds the ring, they'll try and use it as a weapon against me. And um, that's what his whole his whole assumption had been, that Aragorn might have the ring, or he might be waiting to use the ring. And that's why he put all these like enemies against, uh, all these armies against Aragorn. Never crossed into his darkest mind that anyone would seek to destroy it. But once Frodo claims the ring right in the chamber of Mount Doom where he made it, he's just like, oh, fuck. Like, Sauron realises, like, you know, the jig is up. Intra uh, just an interesting little tidbit. So do you know when Aragorn's fighting the troll yeah. here? That was originally meant to be Sauron, you know? So they filmed some scenes where, well, they filmed that as it was Sauron fighting... Um, Aragorn. Aragorn, yeah. Also, so Ar Sauron was meant to come into the battle as a person, like because he's still got a physical form. But luckily, Peter Jackson kind of must have saw sense and realised it'd be better to keep Sauron out of it and keep him as an abstract concept. But it would have had a mirror of uh, Finrod. Is it Finrod? I think it's Finrod. Finrod versus Morgoth. Um, when Mo outside of Angband, when um, Finrod says like, "Come forth, you." fucking coward and then Morgoth has no choice but to, to come out and fight him and he kills him but um, he gets wounded so badly that Morgoth feels it for the rest of his life um, but no uh, it's just it got changed into a troll because it was much better to keep Sauron as this abstract concept yeah. of, of evil um, but then we go back again back into the, the the Mount Doom and Gollum attacks Frodo uh, Sam knocks him senseless with a rock and then looks at the he looks at the footprints and sees Frodo's footprints and bite, jumps on him, bites his finger off. They tussle, uh, and then in the books, Gollum falls off the edge into the lava and he slips. And the only reason he slips is that's why Frodo needed to be there. And that's why Gollum had his life spared the whole time. It's Eru Iluvatar, it's God, who causes Gollum to slip. Right, okay. And that's all it needs. So do you know what I mean about the dominoes being set up? Effect. 
everything perfect. Everything needs to be just right, yeah. Um, and that's what I'm saying about, you know, like the dominoes were set up thousands of years in advance and stuff like that. Yeah. So in the books, it, it starts, Frodo was always going to fail and Gollum needed to be spared as much as frustrating as he was because right at the end, when it was mattered, Eru intervened directly and it was just that little that little nudge that caused him to slip and fall into the lava. In the, it's it's that it's that level of subtlety that the that you know a god you'd expect a god to work at. Um, in the books, it's just more like they tussle and then they both fall off. Um, Frodo and and Gollum, but Sam pulls Goll- uh, Frodo back up, whereas Gollum dies happy, which is nice. He gets yeah. a happy ending. He dies with the precious, and finally the ring is destroyed, and it's done. Baradur collapses, including the foundations. So the big thing is made in the books in that when without Sauron being destroyed last time at the War of the Last Alliance, Baradur just fell to its foundations, but its foundations remained. This time with the ring gone, the foundations are gone, and that's Sauron. Um, obliterated. Not obliterated, but kind of reduced to a spectre, never be able to like take form or really... Um, in interfere with Middle Earth again, but yeah, uh, then we see that the the armies of Sauron start to flee when Mordor itself cracks open and Mount Doom erupts properly. Um, eagles are sent to rescue Fram and uh, Fram, so Frodo and Sam from the lava, where they are rescued, and uh, when they wake up, they you know, finally it's it's all well and good. We skip that forward. Sound, like honestly, that scene just look like pure heaven to me like i wish i could have such a good sleep that i woke up just like refreshed in beautiful sunlight yeah and just ah like it just looked like they'd had such a good sleep yeah yeah that might be coming from a parent they did look like they had a good sleep. Like it was, I was just really... like, oh yeah, he looks so refreshed. Right. But then we do um, this now. We're right. This is the end now. So we're gonna wrap through quickly the events now. So we'll talk about the end up to the end of the film, and then we'll have a little bit about what happened afterwards. But we uh, we see Aragorn crowned, and he sees Arwen again for the first time. His queen. Who we thought had left Middle Earth. And her dad. Yeah, and um, when Aragorn's crowned, uh, when Gandalf says, like, so come the days of the king. Uh, do you know what? That's really cool. It's like Gandalf crowns Aragorn. Like, you're essentially being crowned by an angel. Like, what the fuck? That's crazy. But he goes, to, he, he gets around to the four hobbits, and they all bow down. They, they bow down, and Aragorn says, my friends, you bow to no one. And then everybody... In uh, Minas Tirith, bows to Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin, which again I teared up at. Um, <laughs> you know, normalize it, normalize it. Tolkien is is the 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 gold standard for male interactions. But um, just a, a note on Aragorn: it goes on to become well, it goes on to be the king of the United Country, uh, the United Kingdom of Gondor and Arnor. So Gondor's the south, Arnor's the north. I think from memory he spends pretty much like six months in each place. Um, and Arnor at the top, that's where the Shire is and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, he rules for 122 years before voluntarily giving up his life, which is his power as a Numenorean. Yeah. Um, he reinstates the borders of the Shire and sticks to his own law that no big folk should enter. So when Aragorn visits the Shire, he sets up on the other side, I think it's the Brandywine Bridge, he sets up on the other side of the Brandywine Bridge and says that anybody from the Shire who wants to come and speak to him can come there because no big people are allowed in the Shire anymore and they police their own borders. Mm. Faramir is the steward and he marries Eowyn and they have uh, kids uh, and whatnot. And Aragorn's son is called Eldarion and is king after him. Um, Arwen we already covered. Yeah. She spends time in um, Linda, uh, sorry, Lothlorien after Aragorn dies, and she eventually dies on the hill. She gives up her life on the hill and is buried there. 
Frodo, I think in the films, like if I heard it right, Frodo says the fourth age of Middle Earth began with Aragorn crowned. It didn't. It starts in September, a couple of years later, when Elrond leaves to go to the West. So when the last of the elves leave Middle Earth, pretty much, that's it's when the fourth age league. starts because it's the dominion of men now. The hobbits go back to the Shire, and the bit that really struck me and that kind of struck, it got me was um, when they sat in the Green Dragon. I think it's the Green Dragon. In. Um, it might not be. It might just be another one. But they're not sure what to say to each other. And I think that might be a little bit about like PTSD. You know, like what can you like? You've got so you've got so many people who are involved in wars and, and conflicts and stuff like that, and they go home. And how do you adjust back to that life? You know, how do you adjust back to that normal life? And um, we see that Frodo doesn't um, eventually, but Sam gets the courage to speak to Rosie. Yeah, which I was congratulating him there. Oh no, Ugh, we've not really talked about it since the first film, but I love Rosie. I think she's probably one of the most attractive women in the trilogy. What about you? What about that Rose Lucy? Uh, I mean, I, th- she, I think she's nice, but I mean, I don't know her personally, so um, <laughs> <laughs> you only see her serving in the pub. So I, you know, she might be awesome oh, yeah. when she gets home. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Oh yeah, I never thought about that. She's got nice hair, like yeah, yeah, fair does. She's got rosy cheeks. Yeah, well, oh, well, I think I. Uh... Oh dear, I think I uh, I put some up. I, I projected on Rosie. Have you been having dreams about Rosie, and oh, you dear. think that they're real? Might be, might be. Um, the big difference here is that um, the hobbits when they go back to the Shire, it's the Shire still. In the books, it's this whole thing it's a big part of the books it's that it's it, the scouring of the shire yeah. so basically saruman walked out of orthanc by telling treebeard he needed to just leave and was allowed to and used his magic bullshit to get past treebeard and he went north and he wandered for a bit because he'd been getting um so there's people in brie who'd been like spies of saruman and had been sending him pipe weed and that so basically, he gets up to the Shire and he takes over and calls himself Sharky. And he starts ripping up large, large, large parts of the Shire. Um, and he has his thugs all over the place who are like basically terrorizing people. Um, do you know the Sackville Bagginses who wanted Bilbo's house? Mm. Lobelia and Otto, um, they turn into a bit of like heroes. Um, so Lobelia. Like fights against the like she rages against the machine basically, and she leads like a resistance till she gets arrested. Otto, I think Grima Wormtongue eats him, um, because Saruman forces Grima to eat a Hobbit like to cannibalize him, which is pretty fucked up. Nice. But uh, anyway, the four Hobbits come back, um, and they the the thugs that Saruman has. They try and push them around, and obviously you've got an esquire of Rohan, a steward, a, a, a guard of Gondor, a ring bearer, and the best fucking gardener Middle Earth has ever seen, <laughs> who's killed. Well, who's either killed or wounded a primordial ancient evil. So they fight back and they lead the the resistance and they sort the Shire out. Um, then Saruman tries to get smart with them before Grima stabs him in the back, just like he does in the films. And then Grima goes to run off and he does something like weird and he gets shot by some of the hobbits, like with arrows. So that's how Grima dies, Wormtongue dies, I'm pretty sure. And then after that, they start to rebuild the Shire and Sam uses some of the soil from from Lothlorien that Galadriel gives him. Mm. And they replant the big tree in the field where they had the birthday party, like Frodo and uh, Bilbo. And they rebuild the Shire that way and then Sam becomes like mayor and that. But that's the big diversion. That's not in the films at all. But um, Saruman really, really fucks it up. Legolas and Gimli, after the events of the film, they visit the Fangorn Forest together. And then... For a honeymoon. Yeah. And then they visit the Glittering Caves behind Helm's Deep, um, which Gimli described as absolutely beautiful. And after all of that, 
they uh, board the ship together that Gimli's allowed to go, and they go west, which um, I'll come on to in a second, but they go to Tol Erisaia instead of that Gimli would most likely go to Tol Erisaia instead of a man. Um, but they go west together, and Gimli's allowed, and I think he meets Galadriel again, who he thinks is the fairest creature, the, the fairest woman to have ever lived. Um, so Tol Erisaia is a bridge between Middle Earth and the Valor, like and a man. So as I, I was talking to you yesterday in the car, basically like originally Tolkien wrote it's a Tol Erisaia becomes England. Um that in his writings, so like Middle Earth is like a history of like Europe and stuff, which is like mm. roughly. Um but Tol Erisaia is an interface between the Elfy, Feywild and the real earth, like the real world. And that's where mortals who say so mortals who set sail on the ships and are allowed to go west, they go to Tall Erisaia because if they can't go to a man for too long because it will kill them. Um so my opinion is it's a bit eldritch because Tolkien wrote that if you go to if a mortal went to a man properly, where the Valar the Valar lived, it would be the best time of your life, but your life would be considerably shorter because you can't live that close to the light of the gods or like what's equivalent to gods and that's just like eldritch horror like it's something that would shorten your life so much it's like radiation but it's just it's absolutely fascinating Frodo Bilbo go west with Gandalf and Elrond which is when the fourth age technically starts if you want to do it that way and Galadriel and Celeborn Frodo leaves because his wounds and time of the ring have just wrecked him his soul's so wounded from it. And his mogul wound will never heal properly and he's weary of the world. He's he's done all this and he's come back. So it's again, it's, like, it's almost like PTSD, like coming back. Do you know, can you imagine coming back from World War One, like when Tolkien was writing? Well, he, he served in World War One, sorry. Um, and suffering all that hurt and injury and then having to come back. Gandalf gets to go home. His mission's done. And he becomes a Lorin again, a Lorin the Maiar. Um, he's the only one to succeed in his mission, and he's been in Middle Earth for about two thousand years. But now he can finally go home again. Which is uh, and Bilbo as a ring bearer was allowed to go as well. But um, so you, you can guess, um, dear listener, that I wept watching this bit as well. <laughs> oh yeah, what about you? You didn't seem. So, what were, were you sad at all, or were you just like? Um, I I was just, it was just like a very sort of light ending, yeah, and then I just felt sorry for uh, Pippin, for Dave, and Mary, because obviously, well, and Sam, until you explained what eventually happens with yeah. Sam, but like I was like, well, why aren't they invited? It's by exception that mortals can go west. Um, we'll get yeah. the uh, the owl biddy on. Well, yeah, Bilbo goes. Sam is allowed to go west eventually because he bore the ring for it for a while, so he was technically a ring bearer. So they can they he can go, but and can his family go with him? No, because it's a long while yet before Sam goes. Um, so Sam. On the day that Frodo goes to the west, to, to Tall Erisaia, Sam inherits Bag End, and Sam also becomes mayor of the Shire, and he serves seven years, uh, seven terms of seven years consecutively. So he's mayor for 49 years, and he has 13 kids with Rosie. And when he gets old... He doesn't have any tellies. <laughs> yeah, but don't know. Um, for 49 years, he becomes mayor, and then he gets to go... And when he goes west, he gives his daughter Eleanor his first order. He gives her like the because um, Frodo gives him the Red Book of Westmarch, which is where they write all the the stories down. Yeah, and that's Sam gives that to Eleanor for her to continue as well. That's how we know the end of Lord of the Rings is because Eleanor wrote it and it was copied to the the libraries of Rohan and Gondor. Okay. Um, but before all that, Sam has thirteen kids with Rosie, and their kids' names are. Oh no! 
Eleanor the Fair, Frodo, Rose, Merry, Pippin, Goldilocks, Hamfast, Daisy, Primrose, Bilbo, Ruby, Robin, and Tolman. And Eleanor becomes a handmaiden to Queen Arwen. And she's called Eleanor the Fair. Merry and Pippin become the heads of their family. And uh, they write books about pipeweed and its history. <laughs> as well as um, you know the, the battles that they were in and, and other stuff like that. And they both regularly visit Gondor and Rohan until their deaths. And they spend time in each. And a final note from me is that after the third age of Middle Earth, which was this was the ending of, the age is quickened, so each age doesn't last as long. And currently now, Tolkien reckoned we were probably in the sixth or seventh age. So that's where we exist now. And that, my dear wife, my dear listener, is the end of Lord of the Rings. Wow, was it? That was a it was a journey. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um did did you have any other questions about the ending that I left untouched? I mean I'll basically give you a, a a rundown of what happens to each main character. Yeah, like my brain is fried every time we talk about it. <laughs> so yeah. but um we're it done. Is, no. It is gently going like through osmosis. Um I am learning more and more as we go but uh oof, and all the names yeah i thought i did that on purpose i thought i'd knock you with the uh, the 13 names of sam's kids at the end yeah just for a laugh uh, that's that's pleasantly made me ready for bed <laughs> if i'm honest <laughs> all those names yeah so i that was uh that was the end of the lord of the rings trilogy um going forward um, it'll be tackled on a, a sub subject by subject basis, either explained to you by a drunk person or explained to you by a sober person, as if I was talking to a drunk person, which will uh, <laughs> depend on how I'm feeling as I'm recording that week. <laughs> I mean, you've drunk every week though, haven't you? Um, pretty much, yeah. I think yeah. I think I have, yeah. So... Just not as heavily as the first week, which really fucked me up. Well, it's I'm totally sober now. For the rest of my life, so from <laughs> from that podcast. No, I was minging the first episode. So yeah. But no, um well I think we'll wrap it up there. Um we'll we'll Thanks see. for listening. Yeah, thank Anyone you for listening. Listens, always you. listening. Yeah, no, thank you for listening. Uh we'll catch you on the next one. And wherever you are, have a good day, good evening, good morning. And I'm gonna say goodbye from me, Chris. And bye from Becca.